We are back with cells and tissues, specifically talking about the bones. Before we jump into everything, if you have not subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and do that. Leave a like on the video. These kind of things, they really, really help. I'm trying to hit um, hit 500 subscribers so that I can start to do more stuff with the channel and hopefully be able to have more time to make content and everything for you guys. So, talking about the bone. Um, Objectives, we're going to talk about the gross anatomy and the microscopic anatomy. Compare the compact versus spongy bone. Um, talk about how bones ossify, as well as then how bones um, remodel. So, <clears throat> kind of the, why this matters. So, we need to understand the normal bone anatomy and the process of which it all forms together in order to understand kind of chiropractic treatment as uh, kind of in, in the big picture, especially if we are going to be treating patients of different ages, different sexes, different races, um, there are going to be minute differences between all of those things where, you know, adjusting a 75 year old um, African American man is going to be very, very different than adjusting a Down syndrome um, f f six year old child. Okay, both of these people are individuals that we absolutely can treat. It's just we need to understand their process, the way that their bodies and their bones are formed before we go into treating um, that kind of individual. So, when we talk about bones, um, it's a s type of specialized connective tissue, as we saw before when we talked about our connective tissues um, in that previous lecture. And there are several important functions of bones. Biggest one is going to be support, obviously for the body, for the muscles. They allow us to move. All of our bones act, act as levers for our muscles to pull on and allow for movement as well as protection, protecting the brain, the spinal cord, the vital organs, our, our ribs, protect the heart, protect the lungs, all of that stuff. Um, there's that movement one that I already mentioned, as well as mineral storage, calcium and phosphorus reservoir. Our bodies need calcium, they need phosphorus for a lot of different reactions, a lot of different processes. And so we always need to make sure that we have the correct amount of both of those going through our running through our body in the different systems so a great place to store it and to hold it um, in case we need it is in the bones a nut last kind of function of bone is a function called hematopoiesis hematopoiesis um, is the creation of red blood cells uh, more specifically creation of blood cells in general, not just red blood cells, but blood cells in general. So when we talk about blood cells, we talk about red blood, red blood cells, erythrocytes, we talk about white blood cells, leukocytes, and we also talk about platelets, which are, which are called thrombocytes. So we'll come back to this a couple of different times as we go through all the different material. So jumping into the gross anatomy, the big anatomy kind of of bone, um, we're going to talk about some of the tissue types, including periosteum, endosteum, the bone structures in general, the classification of bones by shape, the articular call it, call cartilage, as well as the blood supply. <coughs> so, jumping into tissue types, all of our bones have two different types of tissue. We have a, the center of the bone, the middle portion of the bone, is spongy, also known as cancellous bone. It's kind of like a, a honeycomb, um, really fine little needles, flat pieces. That can, they make this honeycomb-like pattern, which we call trabeculae. <coughs> Excuse me. And this trabeculae the reason why it's built this way, if you've ever played any of those games like where, on your phone or anything where you have to build a bridge and you can notice that building little triangles or smaller shapes often provide a lot more stability 
than just something straight. And the same idea is here. The spongy bone is really what gives our bones a lot of that resistance to forces. So it plays a very important role. On top of that, the space in between all of the spongy bone is where we're going to be having, we're containing some of our bone marrow. Um, there's two different types, there's red and there's yellow marrow, and we'll get a little bit more into that um, in, some, in a couple more slides. So spongy's on the inside, the outside is the cortical, there's three names, compact, aka cortical, aka lamellar bone. Apologies. The compact bone is a dense outer layer that is on every single bone, and that's what appears smooth and solid. So when we pick up a bone and we look at it, that outermost layer is that thick, dense, compact bone. And again, we're going to come back to these later on in the PowerPoint um, when, when we dive more into, like the, into the microscopic components of bone. So membranes, talking about more of the general growth structure of bones, there are two membranes that we look at when we're talking about these bones. We have periosteum, remember peri is going to be our outer layer, and endosteum, endo being inside. So we have an outside membrane and an inside membrane. So on each of our bones, if we zoom, zoom way in, we have the cortical layer of bone. On the outside of the cortical bone, we have periosteum. More on the inside of the cortical bone, we have endosteum. The periosteum is also made up of two layers, a dense fibrous membrane that covers the outer surface of the bone, and then there's also a, an osteogenic layer. And we'll look at both of those. So the fibrous layer, is made up of dense, irregular connective tissue uh, consisting of sh these structures called Sharpie's fibers that secure to the bone matrix. It, we'll talk about Sharpie's fibers in the next slide. It contains collagen fibers, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, all nerves, all the kind of stuff uh, that, that are, are we need that are going to go along the periosteum and then dive into the bone through a foramen. So that way we can go and supply the nutrients and the nervous structure, the sensory structure that we need inside of the bones. As well, the periosteum, this is going to be providing uh, attachment points for tendons, ligaments, and allowing the muscles to anchor to bones. Kind of a, more of a real world example, what, what actually is periosteum? If you've ever eaten any kind of food on the bone, think ribs, chicken legs, chicken wings, anything like that. Sometimes when you're biting or you're really going after the meat, there's a thin layer that's directly covering the bone. It's like a film and that'll peel off the bone directly. That is actually the periosteum of the bone and it's just that very outside layer. Now, these structures <clears throat> called the Sharpie's fibers, I want to really make sure that we understand these. This is what anchors that fibrous layer to the bone. So we have right here that fibrous layer. And then below that we have that, um, we can have a, more of an osteogenic layer. Let me actually double check on that and erase. Yeah. So we have the outer layer, we have the progenitor, uh, a progenitor layer, the osteogenic layer, progenitor layer, same thing. And <clears throat> we have these fibers called these Sharpie's fibers that run from that outer fibrous layer into the bone, all the way down into what is what we'll call the matrix. It goes into the cortical bone to anchor the, os the periosteum to the rest of the bone so it doesn't go anywhere. <clears throat> now the osteogenic layer is the inner layer. I'm gonna correct something that I said 
a little bit ago when we talked about it here, the outside membrane versus inside membrane, it's not necessarily the inside membrane of the cortical bone, it's still technically on the exterior of the cortical bone. It's just deeper, deep to the periosteum. Okay, so that osteogenic layer, that's the inner layer right up against the bone, right up against the cortical bone, and it contains primitive osteogenic stem cells. So previously we talked about stem cells, we talked about pluripotency, all that kind of stuff. So we have bone stem cells that can be converted to a bunch of different things, and this is where they reside. They reside in this little layer in between the outer fibrous layer and the cortical bone. <coughs> there are some of the, the, these stem cells can turn into so these are some of the cells that they can turn into. They can turn into osteoblasts, with our, which are the bone forming. I like to say bone building cells. Osteoblasts build. Osteoclasts are the bone resorbing cells. It kind of sounds a little bit weird that it says these are the bone break down cells. So they actually break down bone. <clears throat> Remember we said that the bone stores our calcium and our phosphorus. So whenever we need that, the osteoclasts are going to break down the bone in order to release calcium, release phosphorus into the bloodstream whenever we need it. <clears throat> As well, there are going to be times where we need to remodel the bones. Notice it, you don't say destroy the bones. What we're doing is essentially, uh, when, when, when our bones get different stresses applied to them in different ways, let's say let's say we decide to take up weightlifting, we decide to take up running. When we do a high impact or a heavy weight exercise, our bones are gonna be doing getting stressed in different ways. So the bone is gonna receive signals to say, hey, we need to start prepping and be prepared for this new activity that we're consistently doing. And so the bone will literally remodel itself, reshape itself in, in different ways in order to better fit uh, what, whatever's going on. It doesn't mention it in this slide, but you should have seen it in your anatomy class. There's something called Wolf's Law. This basically says um, the force or pressure you put on bone will cause it to change shape. Change shape and or strengthen itself. <clears throat> really important thing to remember. Here's just a little picture of those different bone cells that we find, the osteogenic cell to osteoblast, osteocyte, and an osteoclast. So that was the periosteum. Now the endosteum is a delicate connective tissue membrane covering the internal bone surface. Apologies again. <clears throat> I'm going to go back and correct myself. <clears throat> Misspoke. It's a little late when I'm recording this. Um, and I just finished a, a decently long day of, of, of prep and all of this. So the periosteum has two layers. A, or so, there are two membranes, periosteum and endosteum. The periosteum has two more layers. It has the fibrous layer and osteogenic layer. Fibrous layer on top, osteogenic just below that. Both of those are on the outside of the cortical bone, so on the surface of the bone. Endosteum is deep. Okay, this is the one that is inside, on the inside of the cortical bone. Periosteum on the outside of the cortical bone, endosteum on the inside of the compact, or aka cortical bone. Different jobs. However, the endosteum is also a single layer of cells. It covers the trabeculae of the spongy bone. It lines the different canals that pass through the compact bone, which we'll talk about later. 
and it also contains the osteogenic cells that can differentiate into other bone cells. Apologies for if there's any confusion. If you have any questions about that, hopefully I cleared it up. Uh, but feel free to leave a comment as well if you have any more questions, and I'll, I'll clarify if I need to. So, <clears throat> back to hematopoiesis or hematopoietic tissue, known as the red marrow. The things in blue are the things that you don't necessarily need to know. Everything else is stuff that this specific professor would like you to know. So red marrow is also known as myeloid tissue, is inside of that trabecular cavities of spongy bone. So all of that extra space inside of that spongy bone, there is red, or there is bone marrow oftentimes. Um, there can be red marrow, can be red, yellow marrow. We'll say in, in certain locations, like down here below, you'll see more of the specific locations, but assume there's, there's bone marrow inside of the trabeculae, okay? And that's function. The red marrow's function is to produce blood cells, including those red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. Now in newborns, there's something called a medullary cavity and all the spongy bone contain red marrow. Uh, we'll see what a medullary cavity is a little bit later. It's basically just the, the center of the long bones. There's a, a gap there that has less spongy bone. Uh, it's there, it's just an opening for mo to have more bone marrow there. <clears throat> so especially in newborns, all of that area, the medullary cavity spongy bone contain the red marrow because there's lots of production of red blood cells and things in a newborn. In adults, the red marrow is primarily located in the spongy bone of specific regions of the bone of specific regions of specific bones. So places like the skull, the sternum, the ribs, the scapula, the pelvic bones, the femoral head, and the humoral head, big ones, the femoral head, the pelvic bones, and especially the skull and sternum. These are the, those are the big ones in adults that are producing, uh, that have the red marrow. Then again, as a person ages, a lot of the red marrow is going to be gradually gradually replaced by yellow marrow. And yellow marrow primarily consists of adipocytes or fat cells. It's less active in the creation of the blood cells, but it still does some. It mainly stores triglycerides, um, provides structural support, and kind of runs back up hematopoiesis, so back up blood creation in case of situations where you have severe blood loss or pathologies that will cause anemia or low blood cell counts. And the, kind of that backup portion is that the yellow marrow can actually convert back to red marrow if the person actually, if your body needs it. Finally, articular cartilage. So articular cartilage is the thin, white, and smooth layer of connective tissue that covers the ends of bones and joints. This is the this place if you look at look at a bone, especially a human bone, the spaces where the bones come together and they connect, oftentimes that specific spot is nice and smooth. That's because that is where the bone was covered in, in, uh, in cartilage in order to form a joint to reduce friction between the bones, letting them move nice and smooth and deal with the weight bearing of movement. Okay, so those are some of the general kind of gross structure of bone. <clears throat> now we're gonna get into a little bit more of the classification. So classifying bones based on shape. There's gonna be five that we're going to cover. We have long bones, short bones, flat bones, irregular bones, and special bones. We're gonna start from the top and work our way through all of these. The ones I really want you to focus on, long bones, flat bones, and then the special bones are the most commonly asked, asked about. 
So the long bones, these are the bones that are longer than they are wide. You can kind of assume by just by looking at it kind of what category the bones fall into. So in the upper limb, like the humerus, the radius, the ulna, the metacarpals, the phalanges, the lower limbs, the femur, the tibia, the fibula, and again, the metatarsals at the feet and the phalanges at the feet. And additionally, the, the clavicle is our other long bone. Just like all the other bones, they, these have compact bone, they have spongy bone, and they also have red marrow, specifically the, the head of the femur and the humerus are the main locations of red marrow in the long bones. Now this is where I really, really, really want you to focus in and understand and know these terms because this is going to be super important when it comes to x-rays, um, when it comes to identifying different components of the bone, and it's going to it's going to come back a lot especially so you really really want really want to know these this terminology um, for the future so all long bones have a shaft this shaft portion is called the diaphysis and then it has the ends which we call the epiphysis so diaphysis epiphysis it's not mentioned here this specific professor um, didn't make a big deal about that this um, but I'm going to add it in here so metaphysis this is between the epiphysis and diaphysis the portion of the bone where it gets wider this is could become super important later on when we start talking about pathologies in future courses so you have the diaphysis, the shaft, the metaphysis where it starts to get wider, and then the epiphysis as well. You'll also have another structure called the epiphyseal line in adults. In adults, it's the epiphyseal line. In children, it's the growth plate. It's the physis. Okay. The epiphyseal line is just the remnant or what where the growth plate was once it closed. So again, epiphysis metaphysis, diaphysis, then another metaphysis, and then another epiphysis. These terms will come back a ton. If you don't learn them now, it will haunt you, so make sure you learn those now. Which is more of the structure going on there. Again, more of the structure. There's that nutrient frame that we talked about where the blood vessels are going in in order to feed the marrow and feed the rest of the bone. So short bones aren't really all hit all that hard when it comes as far as like exams go. Um, just understand these are our kind of our, our wrist and our feet bones. They're kind of cube shaped, similar length, width, thickness, that kind of stuff. So those are those short bones. Other than that, they don't do a whole lot. Uh, as, far as like testable material it goes. Flat bones, these definitely are tested. So they consist, it's a thin plate of, uh, there are thin plates of spongy bone, which are, it's known as the diploe, which is, and then covered by compact bone. So you have these thin layer, these thin, these compact bone, and then the spongy bone called diploe, All this is kind of re repeat stuff as well. Spongy bone, compact bone, just make sure you know, know the terminology. Here, here are all of our flat bones, the cranial bones, the uh, specific cranial bones, the, the main ones, the, the frontal, the parietal, and the occipital bones, the scapula, the sternum, the ribs, the nasal bones, the vomer, the pelvic bones as well. Big ones that are always tested on pelvic bones, sternum, cranial bones, these guys. These are the ones they like to test on. And the function is, to, again, protection, like the ribs, the sternum, um, the cranial bones, all of those guys, lots and lots of protection. And then hematopoiesis, because this is where we have get a lot of our red marrow as adults still. The irregular bones, these aren't usually tested. It's basically just the kind of the catch-all of, hey, all those other oddly shaped bones 
you know, the vertebrae, the jaw, a bunch of bones in the skull, like the sphenoid bone, the ethmoid bone, the hyoid bone, all of those are, are those irregular bones, you know, where they don't really, they don't do hematopoiesis, they're not multi-purpose, they really just kind of do, they're there, they do their job, they do their protection, they help with movement, that kind of stuff. Um, they're not, you know, doing a bunch of other jobs. So, just know that, specifically know, vertebrae are irregular bones. Now, special bones, there are two types of special bones. We have sesamoid bones, and we have wormian or sutural bones. The sesamoid bones are bones that form within tendons. Most commonly, the three that you should know, uh, there's always the patella. There's typically sesamoid bones uh, on the big toe and as well as on the thumb. Typically, that's where you'll find sesamoids. You can have them sporadically throughout other parts of the body. They're not really, you know, necessary everywhere. You might not even have sesamoid bones at all in your foot or in your hands, and you won't necessarily have any issues without them. So <clears throat> some people have extras, some people have ones that are split, some people have ones that are fused. You'll see all of those kind of irregularities in those cases in your imaging courses. But just understand these are, are pretty much, these are incidental findings. Like if you see sesamoid bones in, in weird places, most often it's, it's incidental, it's not that important, it's not gonna be causing pain or causing issues most of the time, unless you know they, they break or they fracture or something like that. Now the other special bones are wormian or sutural bones. So actually everybody has a lot of these. It's just often they're so, so, so small. You don't ever really see them. This is an example of a really big one. It's just essentially extra bones that form with um, along the suture lines as the, the sutures are ossifying. As well, you'll learn in your anatomy courses that these sutures are, they classify them as synarthroses, meaning without movement, without a joint. We now know and understand that that's actually incorrect, that while these sutures are very, very tight and hold together extremely well, there actually is a very, very small amount of movement between them techniques like cranial adjusting um, which has works phenomenally for, for many many people suffering with migraines or people who have had uh, repeated TBI type stuff examining the skull and checking and adjusting the cranial bones and adjusting the sutures helps a lot as well as babies babies adjusting when these sutures are still open very very gently is um, another very very cool thing that we can do so <clears throat> I am going to actually stop this video here and the next part we're going to continue with the microscopic anatomy of bone